It's biology with Mr. B. Biology with Mr. B. That's me! Hello everybody! Right, first job in this YouTube lesson is I set at the end of the last webinar for you to have a go at tasks three and four. If you have done them, then great! Listen to this, I'll go through, use a green pen, make it look all greeny, bluey, like, you know, super sexy, um, and we'll go from there. So. Oh, I may, may as well just say uh, the rest of this video, um, hopefully you see the title of the YouTube, is actually we're focusing on blood, tissue fluid and the lymphatic system. So talking about blood and how that blood might be moving to actually supply cells with oxygen, uh, glucose and, and so on. So here it goes. Uh, in this table here, uh, you are asked to first draw and label a cross section. So hopefully what you've kind of done for an artery is there'll be a small lumen. Yes, you can see my small lumen. There'll be a thick layer, and that thick layer would have uh, the smooth muscle and elastic fibres. Um, you hopefully may have even done a little folded endothelial layer ahead of that lumen. Maybe, maybe a little folded endothelial, you know, cheeky little, cheeky little folded endothelial layer. And on the outside, a nice thick layer of collagen fibres, that's structural protein. Uh, the vein would have exactly the same things in it, except the vein would have a much larger lumen, no need for a folded endothelial here. So just clarify that is my artery and this one is my vein. Uh, it would still have the layer of smooth muscle and elastic fibres, but it would be much thinner and it would still have the layer of collagen, but again it would be much thinner. So there's your vein. Uh, in terms of capillary, I, I love drawing and labelling a cross section of a capillary. You ready? That's, uh, especially if you try to do it in context compared to the artery and vein. See that dot? There you go. That's my capillary. All right, I'll make it a bit bigger. So there'll be one teeny tiny layer of endothelial cells. Oh, I can't spell endothelium. And obviously the small lumen in the middle as well. Okay, so that's hopefully your drawing and labelling of a cross section. Okay, so in terms of the rest of these, um, a lot of these are tick box, so either yes or no, or you might have had a few adjectives here and there, like muscle in wool, for example. Uh, you can put yes, the artery has smooth, lots of smooth muscle. The vein has a small amount of smooth muscle and the capillary has no muscle. Hmm, am I a capillary? Maybe. Uh, elastic tissue, artery has, yes, lots of elastic tissue. It needs to constantly stretch and then recoil back as the blood pulsates through. Uh, the vein, yeah, it has elastic tissue, but not a lot because it's not under pressure and capillary has no elastic tissue. Lumen. Uh, relative to the diameter, the lumen's uh, diameter is incredibly small compared to the rest of the artery, and the veins is incredibly large. Capillary, in all fairness, compared relative to diameter, it's it's huge. It only has this teeny tiny thin endothelial layer, but I think if you read this idea of that lumen, we still need to really clarify for that lumen, it is one cell wide. I mean, one red blood cell, one erythrocyte wide at a time. So really not. Okay, permeability, uh, artery and vein, no. Um, the smooth muscle like the fibres and the collagen fibres are not directly permeable to things. And the capillary, yes, there is permeability. Uh, things can move across the capillary by diffusion. And another method, which I'll show you as well. Uh, in terms of valves, artery, no, no valves. Vein, yes. Needs the valves to prevent pack flow. Capillary, no, no valves. They, they have nothing except a lumen and endothelium. Uh, right, direction of blood flow. This bit's a bit more, a bit more interesting. Blood flow will always start in the artery, then capillaries, and then veins. So direction of blood flow in the artery is away from the heart towards capillaries. In the vein, it's away from the tissues towards the heart. And in the capillary, from the artery to the vein. 
from the artery to the vein. Capillary is always taken from artery to vein. Blood pressure. Uh, pressure of the artery would be very, very high. And in the vein, it would be very, very low. In the capillary, it will be also very low. So you're very well going to put high for artery and then low and low for capillary and vein. The capillary and the vein should have a very similar uh, blood pressure. But obviously, the further the blood gets away from the heart, the lower the pressure. So you could also imply the veins have even slightly lower pressure than capillary, if that were possible. Uh, in terms of pulse and speed of flow, these relate directly to blood pressure. So artery had a really big blood, really a high blood pressure. And therefore, yes, you can have that pulse because that pulse is caused by the elastic fiber stretching of recoiling, which is the arteries, what the arteries do. And the speed of flow would be very fast as a result of that high blood pressure. Whereas you do not get a pulse in vein and capillary because the speed of blood is very slow. The notes bit was just for you to write any notes you had uh, in terms of function. Well, the artery, the arteries function, uh, deliver oxygen and nutrients to respiring tissue. The veins function are to deliver blood back to the heart to be pumped. Um, again, that blood back to heart to be pumped, that could be, you know, pumped back to the lungs to excrete, like waste products, like CO2, or it could be back to the heart, because it's just come from the lungs, so we need to go back to the heart to del deliver the oxygen. Uh, in terms of, for the vein capillaries, um, uh, just the idea of diffusion. It's diff the capillary's job is, is to be a, provide a really lovely platform for diffusion of uh, molecules in and out between the respiring tissues and the capillary and the blood. So there you go. That's task three. I hope that was fun. Task four. Proper questions now. Uh, so yeah, an actual exam question. Uh, we have X, we have Y. You have to try and label bits and say what bits are and, and things like that. So let's let's give this a cheeky little go. Okay, look. so A, B, C, D, what are they? Right. I'm just going to do this in slightly different order. I'm going to go sort of like lumen and then outwards. So the lumen is the middle bit, the hole, and that is C. Uh, is there anything like, yes, B is labeling that black line surrounding the lumen. So B must be the uh, endothelium. So this next layer, is that labelled? Yes, it is. It's labelled as A. That next layer, we, we don't know, but it's going to be a mixture of smooth muscle and elastic fibres. So if you put smooth muscle, that's fine. If you put elastic fibres, that's fine. If you've put both, that's fine. D is the last layer. So that must be uh, the... Oh, my brain's just saying cartilage. Cart it's not cartilage. Um, it is... Bolo oh, come on, Bateson. Collagen. You see, whenever I make big pauses like that, you might think, oh, it's great. I can just go away and edit it. To edit it, like, it's all right just to chip it, like, clip it and edit and, and like, clip um, whatever. But then it takes, like, five hours to, like, then um, save it as the type of file format I would need to load to YouTube. So you're stuck with that pause. Now, that's forever going to be ingrained in my life. The Mr. Bateson, the one who, under pressure, thought of cartilage and couldn't think of anything else. But yes, D is collagen. E. State uh, blood vessels X and Y, explain, and then an explanation of why you think. X is your artery and Y is your vein. How do we know that? Just make myself some room by erasing all that at the top. We know it because, well, I'm looking at explanation. I'm, I'm, all of this bit here is four marks. So you can imagine maybe one mark for the X and Y. So the explanation is going to be a, maybe a few different things. Uh, the first point that I know that it is a artery. Look at the endothelium. Look at it, it's all bumpy. It's folded. But it's not in Y, is it? It's smooth. It's 
So my folded endothelium is X and it's not in Y. Look at the layer, the, 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 the uh, layer labelled uh, A, the layer of smooth muscle and elastic fibres. It's a much larger, or maybe you've put wider, maybe you've put thicker layer of smooth muscle and elastic fibres in X compared to Y. Now, the layer of collagen, I nearly did it again, the layer of collagen does look very similar, so we can't really comment there. And can we comment on the size of the lumen? It's not a massive difference, but I guess the lumen of X is slightly smaller. Smaller X is smaller. Lumen in X is smaller than that in Y. So they, they, there's different things that you could get for that. For two, uh, explain how blood flows back to the heart in veins. So this is a nice, clever question because we've implied that veins are under really, really low pressure. So how does blood actually get back there first? I really hope you've commented on valves to prevent uh, blood flowing backwards, to prevent the backflow of blood. So this means if we were to apply any pressure to the blood in, in the vein, there's only one direction it could go, and that would be back to the heart. So well, the main way we actually then apply that pressure is veins have thin walls, so skeletal muscles contracting can squash them. Causing blood to move in the direction dictated by the valves which will always be back to the heart. Question three. Suggest why arteries close to the heart have more elastic fibres than their walls and arteries further away from the heart. Nice suggest question. So there's no, I say there's no absolute right or wrong answer here, but it has to be logical. It has to make sense scientifically. Uh, so I'm going to presume pretty much everyone has said uh, arteries close to the heart are under a slightly higher pressure. So the artery needs to expand or maybe says stretch more for every beat of the heart, for every time the blood goes whooshing uh, through the artery. Okay, so that is my tasks three and four. Thank you very much for doing them. I hope as I've gone through it, you've been able just to just load lots of green pen in, hopefully lots of green ticks and you're feeling awesome about yourself. But if you've been there like filling in extra things or changing things, well, that's good as well, because that's the whole point of learning. Anywho, so today, this, you know, the actual new bit to this is looking at your blood as a tissue, uh, tissue fluid, oh hello. I'm so confused what just happened there. I don't want to rehearse my timings, I just want to do a normal PowerPoint. Why are you being so weird? I just, what's going on? I'm so confused with what this PowerPoint is doing. Either way, I seem to be in control of it, so it'll be fine. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. I really need to go back and edit this video, but I'm not because it takes so long. Either way, um, tell you what, I'll just, just double check match it. Yeah, I'm still recording. We're all good. Uh, blood tissue through the limb. So the spec point, the learning point. Sorry, I've just, oh, I've lost myself now. The spec point that we have to do is D. Uh, so if you look at the spec points in the booklet, uh, the formation of tissue fluid from plasma, including reference to hydrostatic pressure, oncotic pressure, that's a new one, and an explanation of the differences in the composition of blood tissue fluid and lymph. So in other words, what is blood? What is tissue fluid? What is lymph? And 
the big one is how do you actually make tissue fluid? How does blood become tissue fluid? So let's roll. So four things to look at. What is blood? So we'll do a little bit of that and then we'll do task seven and we'll go through. Uh, then we'll look at what is tissue fluid, how it's formed, how the fluid then returns to the blood. So we, there's a little bit of maths involved because we can do a bit of calculation work. And what is lymph? What is lymph? What is the lymphatic system? What is this extra transport system inside your body that you maybe ne never even knew you had? And how is that formed? And then when we've done two, three and four, there's a couple more tasks. I think it's task five and six that you can go at, have a go at. And I'll go through in this video as well. So a bit about blood. Your blood, because you're a mammal, is held in the heart and blood vessels in a closed circulatory system. And it consists of a suspension of blood cells in a watery fluid called plasma. So the blood cells are your erythrocytes, your loose sites. So red blood cells, white blood cells. And technically, you can consider platelets as a type of blood cell as well. They are certainly formed from the same stem cells as erythrocytes and leucocytes, even though they're a little bit of well, they're, they're, they're just a bit de they're a bit of a deformed cell, you know. They start to develop normally, and then just their development stops, and they're all deformed. You know, we've all got friends like them. It's just one of those. Still, the plasma, so that watery fluid, has a huge range of dissolved substances. So oxygen, I mean, don't get me wrong, most oxygen is inside the red blood cells, bound to the haemoglobin, but there is still some oxygen dissolved in the blood plasma. CO2, uh, mineral iron, salts uh, are in the blood plasma. Glucose, fatty acid, amino acids, so products of digestion, are dissolved in the blood plasma. Hormones being transported around the blood, yeah, in the blood plasma. And plasma proteins, which have a wide variety of roles, including, if I go back to maybe a little bit of a protein theory, uh, including um, because they are amphiphatic. They're, that means uh, they are have a couple of different charges. That means they can be used really nicely as a pH buffer, ensuring the blood doesn't get too acidic or too alkaline, depending on you know what's in it. Put it this way. If you eat loads of protein, your blood's going to have loads of amino acids in it. That could affect the um, pH, couldn't it, of the blood, and therefore maybe affect some of the proteins inside the blood, like hemoglobin. But because the plasma proteins are there, they act as a buffer, and therefore keeping the pH uh, at a desired optimum level, more or less. So, task seven. So what I'll do, um, this is a time, if, you, if you're doing this live, uh, you stop, have a go at task seven, and then put me back on, because I'm, I'm going to go through it now. Okie dokie. So um, the start of task 7 is very, very difficult because that diagram in A, A in particular, is just, just a terrible diagram. Uh, but looking at B is a little bit nicer. So how many types of blood cells can you see in terms of looking clearly at the top one? It's very difficult to see different types, but I can certainly see two different types, can't you? Um, in this bottom one, we've got the red blood cells, the erythrocytes, the little biconcave discs, and we have some neutrophils. Uh, so some white blood cells, neutrophils. I know the neutrophils because I can see their lobed nucleus. So if you did a drawing of those cells, good for you. Anyway, three ways that you can distinguish the red blood cells on the smear. I'm even going to include uh, this bit at the top, other than by colour. So the white blood cells are much larger. Okay, so much larger cells. Let's look at B, white blood cells, much larger. Number two. If you can see a nucleus, it's not a red blood cell. Red blood cells do not have a nucleus to make room for all their haemoglobin. Which also means, because I can see, can you see in A, there are cells that are doing mitosis? The only cells in your blood that will do mitosis, cell division, will be white blood cells. Because to do mitosis, you need to have a nucleus. That's quite nice. Uh, you may have also, if you were looking at B, you may have talked about like the, have it seeing the lobed nucleus. That, that's fine, but I'd put it in the same marking point as the nucleus point. And then calculate the average diameter of a red blood cell using the micrograph. Um, yeah, very 
difficult to do, um, especially unless you have printed out your own copy. But even then, depending on the printers we've used, we've probably all printed them out at slightly different sizes. Uh, so you all probably got slightly different answers. And I, I don't have a hard copy of this booklet. I've not been using one. I've not printed one. So effectively, guys, I'll run you through what the method would be. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna presume what the uh, mill what my ruler measurements would have been. So firstly, I am working out uh, the average diameter, so I'm working out an actual size. So I know my I am triangle, my formula, my maths. So actual size is the image size, so what I get with the ruler, divided by the magnification. So what I get with the ruler. Now, what you've hopefully done to get an average diameter of a red blood cell, um, you've got a ruler to some of these red blood cells. Maybe you like got a ruler to like five of them and then took an average. That might be a good way to go. Doesn't actually say which uh, diagram to use. You might have used A, you might have used B. Um, I'm going to presume you've used A. So I might have done a ruler of five of them and kind of just took an average. Uh, ruler measurement of the five. Let's say that average measurement was, I don't know, 2.1 millimeter, um, 2.1 millimeters. Can I get 0.1 of a millimeter? Probably not. Let's, let's say it was two millimeters exactly then. That'll do. So the magnification. So in that first one, the magnification tells me is times 900. Now, 2 divided by 900 is going to give me a very, very small number, so I don't want a really small number, I want a number I can actually use. So what I'll do very quickly is I'll convert that 2 millimetres into micrometres, which would be 2,000. Notice I'm always including the unit in the calculation. I'm doing that not because I'm supposed to, because I think the you get told off. I used to get told off massively by an old English uh, math teacher when I was at school whenever I did things like this. Um, but it just helps you remember it. It helps you remember what you're working with as, as you're going and it avoids little silly mistakes. So 2000 divided by 900. Let's get my quick calculator. Not that you've got the same answer, just I hope you've uh, followed the same sort of method. So that apparently tells me that my actual size of those things, if it was two millimeters wide, would be 2.2 .2 recurring micrometers, because I'm in micrometers. Okay, beautiful. So E, if hemoglobin were free in the plasma, it would mean that loading and unloading of oxygen there would have one less surface membrane to diffuse through. That sounds good. One less membrane to diffuse through. Uh, should be quicker, right? So why is it an advantage to have all the haemoglobin packed into cells? That's a really, really good question. Right, let's have a look at it. So this box that I've just drawn represents uh, inside the blood vessel. And this box to the side represents the tissues, the cells. So if you had, I don't know, let's say you've got 10 bits of oxygen and those 10 oxygen, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those 10 bits of oxygen are not inside haemoglobin. They're not bound to haemoglobin. They're not inside cells. They're just free in the blood plasma. Um, well, look at that. Blood, blood vessels got 10. The cells have got much less. You know, you're going to get diffusion. You're going to get movement of oxygen into those cells. Try it again. This time, all my oxygen is going to be inside one cell. Actually, I know how this works. Um, one red, well, no, one molecule of hemoglobin can bind to four oxygens, and there's, you know, several hundred thousand hemoglobins inside each red blood cell. So each red blood cell can have a huge number of oxygen inside. So let's just draw one red blood cell, and all ten of my oxygens, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, are inside that one cell. So compared to it being free, I've collected all the oxygens, which gives it a really high concentration in one place. The concentration inside the cell is exactly the same. But now we've got a steeper concentration gradient because all the oxygen is in one place. 
So if this were a capillary, and the, remember, bear in mind, the capillary would be, the walls of the capillary would be right like that. We've now got all the oxygen in one place and therefore really steep concentration gradient moving the oxygen into the cell. The only other thing you might clarify in terms of you might have put about it being sort of like um, stored within, st I guess stored along the journey inside a cell, that extra membrane might give it that little bit extra protection. Um, should a uh, uh, again, hemoglobin is a protein, so if anything were to happen in the blood plasma, like altering pH, um, obviously it can be significantly affected. So by being inside the red blood cell, inside the erythrocyte, that potentially gives all the hemoglobin a little bit more protection as well. Cool. Blood viscosity is lowered with all the hemoglobin packed into cells. Why is that advantageous for blood to have a lower viscosity? So if something's really viscous, then it's a uh, very, very thick, thinker uh, McDonald's milkshakes. Do you know the ones you like when you, when they make them? Milk sh shakes. Oh, I nearly wrote something rude then. <laughs> McDonald's milkshakes. Uh, do you know like when they give you these milkshakes and you try to suck it through the straw? This was in the olden days when we had plastic straws as well, which actually you could get a little bit of purchase out of. And it would just be like the most effort you've ever done in your life just to get a tiny bit of like strawberry flavoured rubbish. I mean, milkshake. Because they were very, very thick. They were very, very viscous. Now imagine the blood was viscous and the heart had to pump it. Think how much effort the heart would have to do to pump that blood around. It'd be huge, huge effort. So the advantage of her blood having a lower viscosity means that per heartbeat, you actually are able to give uh, the blood more pressure and therefore enable it to move faster. If the more viscous it is, the slower it will move. G. The water potential of blood is made, yeah, made less negative. That means um, if water potential is less negative, that means there's more water in it by packing the hemoglobin in blood cells. What effect would a more negative water potential have on body cells? So if the water, I'll, I'll do two. So here's my body, here's my body cell. And everything around it's the blood. So let's say the water potential of this one is less negative. So let's say it's minus 2.4. And let's say here it's more negative. So it's minus 20.4. There you go. There's a nice difference. Well, minus 2.4 is actually very close to zero and therefore very close to, you know, pure distilled water. So very watery solution. You're going to get a lot of that water moving into cells by osmosis, you know, taking dissolved things with it, like oxygen. However, in the more negative, that means it's probably quite solute quite salty. So you might have water actually leaving cells by osmosis down a water potential gradient. And therefore, what will that do to the body cell? It will shrivel, it will crenate. And obviously a shriveled shell, a shriveled shell, a shriveled cell is not a functional cell. There we go. There's task seven. Some good questions there, tricky questions, but I like it. Okay, let's keep learning something new. Tissue fluid. Tissue fluid is the fluid that surrounds your cells and your tissues. And tissue fluid is formed from plasma leaking out of your capillaries. So before we just get to this question, just have a look here. Ooh, can I use a pen? Ooh, nice. Oh, actually, does it say laser pointer? What a la oh, look at that. Wow. Oh, I've never been more happy. That's, that's a massive overstatement, but it's cool, isn't it? Um, so uh, blood will always start in the artery. It's just come from the heart. Obviously, the artery is under high pressure and the artery branches into an arteriole, so now lower pressure, then branches into capillaries, so super low pressure here. But is it low pressure? It's still higher pressure than, you know, all the cells around it, isn't it? They're not being pushed at all. So we say capillaries are low pressure only contextually compared to arteries. 
the pressure inside the capillaries is still higher than the tissue fluid. So can you see the yellow arrows here? Some of that plasma, so the watery part of the capillary, is actually forced out of the capillary into the surrounding cells, the surrounding tissues. And that is called tissue fluid. And that's how tissue fluid is formed. The reason it does that isn't diffusion, it is an osmosis. The reason it does that is because of a pressure gradient. There is a higher pressure inside the capillary than there is in the tissues. And that means fluid is able to get forced through little tiny pores in capillaries. We call them fenestrations when you when you get to an, uh, a, a year 13 and we look at them properly when we do the kidney. But these little tiny pores, they can let out just that little bit of the fluid, little bit of the uh, plasma, and all the plasma that gets into the tissue fluid, get in, in where the tissues are, is called the tissue fluid. Now the question here, which components of the blood plasma will not be found in tissue fluid? Anything that is too large to fit through those little pores in the capillary. So all the cells, erythrocytes, leucocytes, the platelets will be too large, and all the proteins, plasma proteins, too large to leak through the capillary endothelial wall. So that movement, it is not diffusion, it is mass flow, it is down a pressure gradient. Now here's where we get a little bit more complicated, here's where we get a tiny bit of maths. There is is not as straightforward as there is one pressure bit involved. You've actually got to consider a few different things to understand where blood is moving and how blood is moving to form tissue fluid. Depends on two types of pressures. Hydrostatic pressure is what you guys are probably familiar with as normal pressure. The pressure a fluid exerts when pushing against the sides of a vessel or container. So the more fluid inside the capillary, the higher the pressure. Which is why, if you look at the green arrows, the pressure in the arterial end is much higher than the hydrostatic pressure in the venial end. Because if all the, you know, if all the fluid moves into the tissues, we've got less fluid, which gives it a lower pressure. A lower hydrostatic pressure. Oncotic pressure, a little bit different. Oncotic pressure is a, it's a way of measuring the osmotic concentration gradient, the water potential gradient. If there is a difference in water potential, that creates a pressure. It's going to create a movement and therefore create a pressure in a certain direction. Notice how the oncotic pressure does not change regardless of what is actually going on in the arterial and venial end. So a little bit of maths involved. If you want to work out the overall sort of blood pressure, you would take the hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure inside the capillary and take away from it the hydrostatic and oncotic outside. So if I take the blood pressure inside, I've got 4.3 kilopascals here and minus 3.3 there. So inside, that is a blood pressure of 1 kilopascal. Outside, well, 1.1, add to that minus 1.3, gives you a total of minus uh, 0.2. So the difference between inside and outside, if this one is 1 and this one is minus 0.2, is 1.2 kilopascals. And because it's positive, that's 1.2 kilopascals of pressure moving the plasma out of the capillary into the tissue fluid, becoming tissue fluid. And the venial end is different. At the venial end, you actually end up with a negative overall pressure. The pressure is higher now in the tissue fluid than it is the capillary which means in the venial end you actually get a net inflow fluid moves into the capillary and that's always going to happen across any capillary unit but i'll let you crack on with the task a bit later and practice that further so what happens to the excess what happens to excess tissue fluid that doesn't go back into the capillaries because not all of it will if there's any excess, it gets drained into another tubular system 
your lymph system or your lymphatic system. Excess tissue fluid enters the lymphatic system or their tubes and the lymphatic system returns it to a vein in your chest called the subclavian vein. The fluid inside the lymphatic system we just call lymph, so lymph fluid. And it is almost identical, identical to tissue fluid in terms of it, what it's made of. The only thing you'll have different is your lymph, your lymph fluid and the lymphatic system has lots of lymphocytes, the white blood cell that is used to uh, help make B cells and therefore cells that produce antibodies. Because these lymphocytes are produced in lymph nodes, which is what the lymphatic system is also. So think of the lymphatic system as a system of tubes that branch off into nodes at several different places. So you can see all the little lymph nodes sort of here. There's a lot, of, a lot in your armpits, uh, in your neck. They're the sort of things you feel sort of swelling when you're when you're poorly swelling because all the lymphocytes super busy, super active. Your, your, your body wants to force all the fluid there. And therefore, all the pathogens will end up there where the lymphocytes are ready to start stimulating some B cell production. OK, so there's a couple of tasks now. Uh, task five, if you've been making notes using PowerPoint, you do not have to do the first bit of task five because it is just a making notes. But please do the second bit of the table. And then there's task six as well. Uh, optional, um, you know, you're always welcome to do the questions in the textbook if you think they will help you. Um, I quite like these ones in the textbook, so give them a go. Uh, the mark scheme for the textbook is obviously on file store already. So. Uh, now's the time to pause me, because if you're going to do these tasks, give them a go and then unpause me, roll me out. This is my last bit now, just to go through them. There we go, that worked. Right, so all the way back up to task five. So this is the bit you didn't have to do if you've already been taking notes, outlining how the tissue fluid is formed. But there is a summary, nice summary. So location of blood plasma. It, <laughs> location, is it blood? Where your it's where your blood is. So inside tubes, inside arteries, veins, and capillaries, inside blood vessels. Location of tissue fluid is surrounding cells, surrounding your tissues. And the location of lymph is inside the lymphatic system. So inside the lymph. Uh, vessels and the lymph nodes. Proteins. So blood plasma, tissue fluid, lymph. Does blood plasma have proteins? Absolutely does. Absolutely. Does tissue fluid have proteins? No, because the proteins are too large to fit out of the endothelial wall of the capillary by the hydrostatic pressure. So, uh, will they be in the lymph? Absolutely not. The lymph is made from excess tissue fluid. Where have the proteins come from? So, no, they do not have them either. Oh. Let's just erase this out for the next one. So, oxygen and nutrient content. Blood plasma. Well, in all fairness, it does depend whether you're looking at an artery or a vein. Let's just presume we look at an artery because you know, that's always the starting point for this. So in the artery, then, yeah, you're going to have um, high levels of O2 and nutrients like amino acids and glucose. And the tissue fluids would have uh, probably the opposite. The reason being, any oxygen in the nutrients that the tissue fluid gets very quickly dissol uh, dissolve very quickly diffuse into the surrounding cells that need it for respiration. And the lymphatic system will always have whatever the tissue fluid has because it's just excess tissue fluid. Okay, waste. So again, it de absolutely depends on what part of the blood plasma you are looking at. Uh, the artery, for example, will have little to no waste, whereas the vein will have lots of waste. I'll, I'm going to presume artery. 
So little to no CO2 and waste products like urea. But the tissue fluid might have, you know, at least a moderate amount, moderate quantity of waste like CO2. You know, um, ultimately the second those uh, blood, those cells in the tissue actually do respiration, there you go, CO2 is produced and it will move, diffuse directly back into the tissue fluid. Now the lymphatic system will have whatever the tissue fluid does. So again, the lymphatic system would have, again, a moderate quantity of the CO2 and the urea and the other wastes. Okay, last bit is the cell content. Um, so the blood plasma is going to have uh, the erythrocytes, leucocytes and platelets. Uh, the tissue fluid, what cells will be in the tissue fluid? You know, for in all fairness, um, it's difficult in this in terms of cell content, but if you think of the tissue fluid as fluid that surrounds the tissue, that therefore implies there are no cells in the tissue fluid. The tissue fluid surrounds cells. There's no cells in the tissue fluid. But I appreciate if you did if you did just put the tissues because it, you know it is. The lymph though, and this is this is what they really what you're trying to think about. The lymph will have lots of lymphocytes in the lymph nodes because that is something that is different to tissue fluid and the blood plasma. Task six, uh, starts with a bit of capillary revision. That's nice. Uh, three features of the capillary, an explanation in the role of exchange. So my first feature, guys, is gonna be the very thin endothelium. And that's gonna mean we have a short diffusion distance. Uh, my second one is going to be its very small lumen, which again helps to uh, ensure that erythrocytes, so red blood cells, move. I'm actually going to I'm actually going to say move in single file. I quite like that, which gives them longer. And the longer they are, the more opportunities for diffusion. Uh, the third one I'm going to do is this one. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, yeah, I'll do diameter is roughly the same as the red blood cell diameter. And again, that links to a short diffusion distance. Um, maybe, maybe another feature you might have put is about the capillaries have very small pores and that does allow uh, plasma to move out uh, down a hydrostatic pressure gradient by mass flow. So question two, so a, a tiny bit of math involved. Calculate showing you're working the effect of blood pressure at B and it, it gives you what A is 1.2. Uh, the reason why A was 1.2 is because you know, that difference there is 1 and that difference there is minus 2. And you've got to take away the blood, sorry, take away the tissue fluid for, uh, and the value from the blood. So minus naught, so 1 minus minus 0 0.2 is, is 1.2. So do the same for this one. So the SP, so that the SP, by the way, by that, they've called it solute potential, but we call it oncotic potential. Um, it's the same idea, though. So of the blood, that's 1.6 plus minus 3.3. So 1.6 minus 3.3. I'm going to be really lazy and do that on a calculator because my brain is not working right now. So minus 1.7. In the tissues, it is 1.1 plus minus 1.3. So again, we, we have minus 0.2, like we did at the arterial end.
So to get the effective blood pressure, you got to take away minus 0.2 from that. So minus 1.7 minus minus 0.2. So we're therefore just adding 0.2, so it should give you a blood pressure of minus 1.5. Effectively, we have a minus number because the pressure of the blood is lower than the pressure of the tissue fluid. So even though the hydrostatic pressure is greater, it's not great enough comparing it to the oncotic pressure. You've got to look at both. In terms of it marking an arrow on the diagram, the direction the blood will move uh, between the blood and tissue fluid at A, hopefully you've drawn a nice big arrow down at A. Likewise at B, you could draw a nice big arrow upwards. Last question, some of the tissue fluid doesn't return to capillaries, but enters another set of vessels. Name the fluid in these vessels. Describe its composition. The fluid is called lymph. Its composition is identical to tissue fluid. So low levels of oxygen, uh, low levels of nutrients, because hopefully they've all been used up by, you know, the cells, the, the cells of the tissue. But it does contain lots of lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. So there you go. That's your biology with Mr. B. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to switch off now, but I'll see you all at the same slot that we did last week for the live webinars. Peace out, guys. Bye.